morning, Black Rock Church, and for those of us joining online, my name is Young, and after being in ministry for close to 20 years, spanning two churches in Manhattan and one in New Jersey, it feels almost surreal and definitely humbling and a privilege to find myself here standing in front of all of you. And so while it's only been about seven months since my wife and I began this chapter in our story, it does feel like I've been at Black Rock Church forever, in a good way, in a good way. (laughs) It's been easy to consider this church my home, and as someone who loves New Jersey with a fervent passion, I am publicly declaring to all of you that I have begrudgingly traded my yellow jersey license plates for Connecticut blue. It's official, there's no turning back. And if that's all the applause I get today, the Lord help me. As for what I do here on staff, I am the director of groups. It's a pretty vague title, but what it means is that I head up our community groups and our living free groups. These are both great ways of getting plugged into this church and deepening the faith relationships that God has called each and every one of us to. So if you have any questions about these things, please reach out to me. You can email me or look for me as I run around like a, like a maniac outside here on Sundays. I'll be more than glad to talk with you. Now, for today's message, I want to ask a simple but important question. What are you investing in? Whether you realize it or not, You're investing in something. You're committing your thoughts, emotions, time, energy, finances, opportunities. You're committing your life in the hopes of receiving a certain return. And while there's nothing inherently wrong with this, if you're not intentional about what you invest in and where you invest and how you invest, you can find yourself spending your life on the things that are ultimately meaningless the temporary things that are not grounded in eternal hope. For instance, how often do you worry about impressing people who don't give two thoughts about you? How much energy do you spend fixating on that one critique despite the endless amount of affirmation you receive? How often is your mind filled with bitterness Anger, the endless obsession for the next escape, being consumed with what you look like, what you sound like, what you smell like. Do you feel stuck in insecurities, jealousies? Do you envy those around you? The list goes on and on, and it can get very, very petty. Years ago, as I mentioned, I was an interim pastor at a church in New Jersey for about six months. It was in an affluent neighborhood. And in this church, someone told me that households would spend thousands of dollars each year competing against one another on who had the better deck furniture, holiday decoration, the best landscape lawns. It got so competitive and nasty that friendships were ruined. As bad as this is, the worst story that I've heard is about a church a few decades ago that split up because the elders could not decide on the color of the new carpet they wanted to install. It's a sad reality, but as I said, so many people invest their time and energy on things that are meaningless. And Jesus, he warned us about this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. And he said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In this passage, Jesus draws a clear line between the things we should not invest in and the things we should invest in. The things we should not invest in are the treasures on earth, the temporary things, 
The things that don't last, the things that can be easily lost, stolen, or destroyed, these are the things that are like vapor disappearing once our 70, 80, 90, 100 plus years here on earth are finished. The things we should invest in are the treasures in heaven. These are the eternal things that we'll carry from this life to the next the things that we'll have with us when we see Jesus face to face. Jesus draws this line and urges us to invest in the treasures in heaven, to commit ourselves to the meaningful things that will last into eternity. And so going back to the original question, as you take stock of your life, as you measure the things you value, what are you investing in? But before you actually go and answer this question, it's important to have a clear understanding of what it actually means to invest in the treasures in heaven. And so that's what I want to unpack for us this morning. So what are the treasures in heaven? What are the things that Jesus talks about, these treasures that moth and rust do not destroy and thieves cannot steal? What are the treasures that are eternal? Because heaven is forever. The Bible gives us the answer in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 to 13. And looking at this passage, we see clearly that the answer is love. We see that the eternal treasure is love because it's love that does not end. And while faith, hope, and love remains, the greatest of these is love. You see, the Bible tells us that love is so central to our investment in heaven that we can have we can speak in the tongues of men and angels. We can have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge. We can have faith to move actual mountains. We can give everything we have and surrender our body to the flames. We can do all of this, but without love, it will amount to nothing. We will be nothing. Without love, we would have invested nothing in heaven. What this means is that if you want to invest in heaven and the things that have real worth and real meaning, the things that last, you have to love. More specifically, you have to love as God's word teaches us how to love. So then, what does the Bible say about love. Now, there's a few places in God's word we can turn to in order to find the answer, but the best place, in my opinion, is found in 1 John. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 tells us, and this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. What 1 John teaches us is that learning to love begins by learning to be loved. We cannot love unless we first understand what it means to be loved. And this is what it means to be loved according to 1 John 4.10. That while we were still sinners, you and I, while we were enemies of God, while we were dead in our thoughts, actions, and intentions, separated from God who has a wonderful plan for us, separated from God who wants to give us peace that surpasses all understanding, separated from God who has a meaningful purpose for us, while we were cut off from God, you and I, because of my sin, Jesus died for us. Let me say it again. In the face of our sin, you and me, Jesus took our place on the cross and died for our sins. And because of what he has done, we have the invitation to be saved by repenting and becoming reconciled 
with God. We have the invitation to be in relationship with him. We have the invitation to call God our good father. We have the invitation to be counted as children of God. And this, this is how we love according to 1 John 4. Again, it begins by receiving love according to the gospel. And for those of you who've never experienced this kind of love, who never experienced what it means to have your sins forgiven in order to be in a right relationship with God, he is inviting you to receive it. God is inviting you to freely experience his love that was displayed on the cross. And if you want to take that step of faith, I encourage you after service to come up. We have a prayer team who'd love to pray for you and talk with you through all of that. Now, going back to the message, as I said before, this is how love begins, by receiving love through the gospel. But love is made complete Love is fulfilled when we respond to the gospel by loving one another. We see this in verse 11. It says, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. If we want to invest in heaven, then our response to the gospel is something we ought to do. Now, This phrase ought to is so important that it's actually repeated from one chapter beforehand. And 1 John chapter 3 verses 16 to 18 says this, by this we know love that Jesus laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brothers in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So here in both chapters three and four, we see that we're called to respond to the gospel by loving one another. It's something we ought to do. And while this phrase ought to sounds like a suggestion, sort of like, you know, we ought to drive 55 miles per hour on the Merritt Parkway. Lord, forgive me for breaking that. (laughs) The word ought to is anything but a suggestion. This word in the original Greek is closer to the concept of responsibility, obligation, what we owe. Understanding this, a more proper translation of verse 11 is because Jesus laid down his life for us. We need to pay back that debt by loving one another. I'll say it one more time. Because Jesus laid down his life for us, we need to pay back that debt by loving one another. We ought to do this because what Jesus did for us is worthy of that kind of response. Jesus' sacrifice is worthy of a response that declares, I must love rather than I might love or I should love or I'll love tomorrow. But I want to make one thing clear. I'm not talking about legalism. The Bible tells us that we can never earn God's love by loving one another. That's not what it means when we're told that we ought to love one another. Remember, God loved us while we were still dead in our sins. So to explain what I mean by this, I want to share a story from my marriage. Oh, married. My wife and I, we started dating back in 2015. And at that time, I was well over 320 pounds and fully diabetic. The demand of ministry became the perfect excuse to live an unhealthy life, and I used that excuse so often. About two months into dating, we had a serious talk about my health, and she said this, I'll never forget it. She said, I'm in this for the long haul, but I don't want to be a young widow. In that moment, I could have been sensitive. I could have acted offended that she brought up my weight, especially because it's only two months into our relationship. 
I could have been defensive. I could have avoided the topic. I could have lied. I could have done so many things, but I saw her heart of love and concern for me even that early on. So instead of running away or making excuses, I responded. I responded by making the difficult decisions and changing because what else could I do in the face of real love and real care and real concern? And it hasn't been an easy road. There's been many ups and downs, but I've been doing my best to continue responding to her love because it's something I ought to do. Not because I owe her anything, but because she loves me so much. And my own love response to her, as we're taught to do in 1 John chapter 3, has been in more than word and talk. I've tried my best to respond in deed and in truth because this is the type of response that all of us are called to do in the face of love. We're called to respond in love that goes beyond nice words and well wishes. We're called to respond to love in a way that is seen in our actions, in a way that is true without falsehood or pretension. So again, in light of the gospel, we ought to respond out of love, not out of obligation. And your love response to the gospel what you ought to do. It can be as simple as grabbing coffee with someone and having a real meaningful conversation. It can be helping someone in need. It can be being a shoulder to lean on. It can be finding the moment to share your faith. It can be praying for somebody in need. It can be taking a step of faith and going on a missions trip or getting involved in outreach. It can be visiting somebody in the hospital when they're sick. Responding to the debt of love can be done through acts both big and small. But above all else, it has to be done indeed and in truth, not in word or talk. And so this, Black Rock Church, this is the full picture of what it means to invest in heaven. This is the investment in heaven each and every one of us is called to, to receive love through the gospel and to respond to that debt by loving one another. So, Given all of this, given the fact that investing in heaven is receiving and responding to God's gospel love, the question that I naturally have is why? Right? It's a, it's a good question. Why? Why should I do this? Why should I invest in heaven? I mean, if all I need to get my ticket to heaven is to believe in my heart and profess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, then why should I do anything else? Why should I invest in heaven if my salvation is secure? Now, there's a few ways of answering this. I can point to the parable of the sheep and the goats to unpack what it means to be saved and not saved. I can point to the calling that all of us have to the ministry of reconciliation, how we have the calling to administer the gospel during our time here. I could point to James chapter two and say how faith without works is dead. But for today, there's two things I wanna highlight. The first is joy. When we take a step of faith and respond to the gospel by loving others, when we lay down our lives for one another as Jesus laid down his life for us, we will experience joy like no other. And that's what we see in Jesus according to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. I'm going to look at verse 2. It says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What this passage tells us is that despite everything that Jesus went through as he laid down his life for us on the cross, all because of love, he actually experienced joy. And this is what we can experience 
when we receive the gospel and respond in love. It's what I experienced in my walk with God, in my marriage, in my family, in my friendships, as I tried my best in ministry, as I've lived in this world, the greatest joys I've experienced, the treasures that have lasted year after year, they've all been rooted in this type of sacrificial love. And here's the thing, as I look back on my life, I can see the pains and struggles. I I can still see the hurts and the wounds, the hardships that came, even as I've tried my best to invest in heaven. But all of that fades away when I compare them to the joys I've experienced on this journey. And that's why we should do it. It's actually one of the greatest reasons why we should invest in heaven. Because there is an eternal joy in doing so that is greater than anything we can find in this temporary world. The second answer I want to give as to why we should invest in heaven is this. Our love for one another, that is evidence of God to the world. We learned this in John 13, 34 to 35, and Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. When we invest in heaven by receiving and responding to love, we actually provide evidence to this skeptical world that God, who is love, is actually real. We give proof to the truth that living a life for God is worth it, that the sacrifice of Jesus is worth responding to. And this world This world is looking for that evidence. There are people all around us searching, seeking, longing for this love that can only be found in Jesus Christ. And God, he is looking at his church. He's looking at us, Black Rock. And he's calling us to love one another in a way that proves to the world that God is love. He's calling us to cut through the noise of hatred, apathy, division. He's calling us to shine as light in the darkness. He is calling us to give the world a real glimpse of eternity. And that's why we should invest in heaven. Because there is so much joy when we do it. And because this world that is fading away needs to see that evidence. So, being here in Black Rock Church, as we gather here week after week, how do we do this? How do we practically invest in heaven? Well, the first thing, again, for those of you who are not in a place to respond, who need to actually experience what it means to be loved, as I mentioned earlier, We ask that you come up, receive prayer, find someone to talk to. There's also community groups that you could be connected in to learn what it means to be loved by brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're going through a specific life struggle or circumstance, we have living free groups that are there to support you in your walk. But for those of you who know what it means to be loved by God, who are ready to respond, All I can say is throw your hat in the ring. Consider joining a team and serving. There's local outreach events where you have the opportunity to help those in need. Consider going on short-term missions. Find somebody who's alone outside and go up to them and introduce yourself. Even that simple. Another great way to apply this message will start in October. We're actually going to have a class that teaches the practicalities of what it means to love one another as we have been loved. In the near term, just like we announced, we have Meet Your Black Rock Neighbor next week. Go out the doors and to the gathering room. There are so many things 
big and small that we're doing in this church where we're trying, we're trying our best to invest in heaven and we're inviting and asking all of you to do so with us. There are so many ways, big and small, so many things that we can do that have real meaning and real worth. But whatever it is that you commit your life to, today and the days going forward, it all begins by pausing, taking inventory of your life and asking yourself that important question, what am I investing in? Let's pray. Um, right now, I just want to take a short moment for us to reflect. Um, and this is not a moment of guilt or shame or regret. It's not a moment where we think of ourselves as less than or not enough. You know, this is a moment where for each and every one of us, um, we just reflect on God's love for us. Whether you are new to faith or, or wrestling with faith, whether you've been a Christian since you've been in your mother's womb, you know, the reminder that God loves us and sent his son to die for us is one that we should never move away from. And so right now, let's just spend just like half a minute just reflecting on that. Father, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that while we were still sinners, while we were your enemies, you sent your son to die for us. And now we have the invitation to be reconciled with you. And I pray that today that that truth will fill our hearts and that we will respond to it. Remind us of your great love. Remind us of your goodness and may it stick with us. May it challenge us. May it convict us to make the decisions in our lives that we need to. We thank you for that. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Have a great Sunday. Say hello to somebody you don't know on your way out and outside. Thank you. You are dismissed. Thank you. Thank you for watching Black Rock Church's Sunday service. We're so glad you found us, and we hope this message made you feel more connected to God. In talking about connection, we find that it's super important for people to be connected to others and to community in order to grow in their faith. So if you're in the area, we invite you to join us to worship in a service. You can find out about our times and locations right here on this webpage. We'd also love to help you connect in a group and find people who can walk alongside you as you continue deepening your understanding and faith. And after you get to know us, you might even like to use your gifts to serve on a team. We believe God gave each of us unique gifts that we can use to serve those around us, one body with many different parts. If you're not able to be here in person, don't worry. We have a great online community and many ways for you to join in virtually and talk to us throughout the week. You can also stay in touch on our website, YouTube channel, Facebook, and Instagram. By visiting our website, you can also easily give your offering one time as an online gift or a reoccurring gift. Just click Give at the top. The Bible tells us that tithing is an important part of our relationship with Jesus, and we want to continue to trust God with our lives and our finances. Well, we are so glad you made the choice to get to know us and view one of our services. We hope that you join us next week. Thanks so much for watching.